Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another <laughs> Zoom edition of the Middleborough School Committee. It's not Zoom, though. What What is it, Sean? All right. All right. Um, so we're trying something different. This is going to allow – it's StreamYard. Thank you. It's going to allow people um, to have the opportunity to comment in real time, and it's going to allow people to ask questions in real time. Um, generally, we take questions that of the public um, that are not on our agenda in the public comment. Um, so you're welcome at this time to add those questions at the bottom of your screen or the side of your screen, wherever it is. Um, I'm going to skip over an agenda piece because we're going to go to the school committee to give people time. I do wish to add that we have received two questions from people um, prior to tonight's start of the meeting. We think both of those questions will be explained in the COVID-19 report. So I'm gonna save those questions for that time. Um, and then we'll have that discussion then. So at this time, I'll ask if any of the school committee members have anything that they wish to bring up. Um, I'll start with uh, Rich Oakley. Rich, do you have anything? Oops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, no, just uh, thanks to the public for working with us on this. And, and thanks to Sean Siciliano for putting this together so we can get public comment going. Um, it, it's it's interesting to be involved and hope to get some good comments and feedback. Great. Greg, do you have anything? Greg Rowe? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, they're definitely appreciated to everything they're doing so far. Um, happy Nurses Appreciation as well. Um, definitely for all those working out in the community and um, those that are in our schools as well. Um, I also want to say it's pretty awesome what the community has done for the seniors. And I, have, I had a conference call with a bunch of different teachers from different schools, and all of them were talking about how one or two things were done for the seniors, and Middleborough's done it all. And there are still things coming, and it's really cool that it's not driven by the school committee. It's not driven by the administration or teachers. It's driven by the Middleborough community, the people that are out there um, looking out for those class of 2020. And it's awesome. It's amazing what they've done. That's fantastic. Thanks, Greg. Meg, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, um, I just want to say happy Veterans Appreciation Day was last Friday. So thank you to all of our administration out there. Great. Thank you very much. Greg Stevens? I'm all set. Everybody said anything that I would. So. Okay. <laughs> and then um, last but certainly not least, Brian G. and Manoni. I, I always do have something to say, and I, I got to tell you, with what is going on right now, what we are doing is uh, we talk about teachable moments, and we're sitting in one of the most teachable moments, I think, in my lifetime, and we, I hope we are ever, ever going to see, but we see everybody, um, uh, I don't want to wax philosophical, but we're seeing that how important every individual across this whole country, every job that is being done by people, people are showing up. Um, there, there's no job too small. And I got to tell you, it's about time we, we start recognizing the true value of every single individual. And uh, I think we're seeing that right now. And it's, it, it's a sad, it's sad that we had to go through this to see that, but it's a teachable moment for all of us. And uh, I, I just, and I'm thankful as, as a parent of the senior, what's going on for these the seniors this year, um, what's going on district and even outside the district. It's just fantastic, the, the community as a whole. So thank you. So I want to piggyback on a couple of things that people have said. Uh, first and foremost, I got to stop by the high school um, that morning when uh, the superintendent and the principal and a group of administrators. Um, and also, I should add, Sean, um, Hutch. Um, and I want to thank the two uh, people who are uh, with the class of 2020, who went around to everybody's home and dropped off a sign and had their own little parade to show them they were special. And that was uh, uh, really meaningful to me. Um, and I'm glad that they were able to start that. Um, they had posted on prior to about everything that um, uh, there was, there was a be surprised the next day and they did a fantastic job and they continued to do a fantastic job. So I want to thank everybody for that. Um, I do want to thank one person I really want to thank is Bob Newton's because he's been uh, really good um, since this whole process started about getting information out. 
I know some people have been annoyed at times with the amount of information and maybe that he didn't have all the answers, but he's doing exactly what you're supposed to do in a, um, in a situation, which is provide everything that you know so people can see it and be a part of it. Um, they can ask their questions. Bob is usually pretty quick to get back to them. So I do want to thank Bob for that um, and be able to add those pieces. Um, every Anybody else have anything that else they want? Then I'm going to move on. Um, Sean, do we have any questions? All right. Then I'm going to move on with the agenda. Um, the next item on the agenda would be the superintendent's report. So I'll turn it over to Superintendent Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and those viewing from home. Uh, I want to bring you up to date on a few uh, items, obviously, on my report. First of all is the COVID-19 item. Uh, we are in currently in what's called phase three. Uh, all of our actions in the Middleborough Public Schools are guided uh, from on high from the Commissioner of Education through the governor. And we have been asked as a school system um, to provide uh, what has been called a thoughtful path pathway towards uh, enrichment and remote learning. And we, th we feel we've done so. We've created an extended learning plan, uh, which is designed, first of all, to care for students. And uh, we need to continue to prioritize uh, keeping our students fed and sheltered, if need be, and supporting their emotional needs and mental health uh, and attending to our most vulnerable students. Uh, secondly, we need to create opportunities for uh, project-based learning and enrichment uh, if possible. And the state has recommended that schools focus on particular items, and we have done so through our extended learning plan. Uh, and then the third one, and I think that's particularly important here as we get into phase three, with all the talk of, of increasing our standards and, and introducing new material is to set realistic expecta expectations. And I think that that is really important uh, with regard to this phase three, and, and I believe well understood and well articulated by our administrators uh, in saying that our expectations uh, continue to be high, but need to be manageable and need to we need to understand separate realities. And we need to understand uh, those folks at home uh, that don't have opportunities, uh, those folks at home that do have opportunities, I would tell you that we did conduct an extensive survey uh, of our families, and we discovered a lot of information. Uh, not a lot of surprises, but a lot of information. And we had just about half of the folks saying, we need more, and, and kid needs, kids need more to do, and they need to be more involved, and they need to, and then the other 50% or thereabouts were, it's too much. Uh, there's too much going on at home. There's not enough screens. There's not enough broadband in my house. I don't have internet service. I don't have enough computers in my house. So it's gone back and forth um, a great deal, and, and we have more information on that survey that, that we'll share out uh, if, if the, the, super, the, the school committee needs that information. Um, moving on, we, we, our idea is to ex do more exposure uh, than require mastery. Um, we're not to particularly, we're, we're looking at uh, sort of credit, no credit, and, and asking students to do more work, keep stu keeping students engaged, uh, and those students that can move on, we move on, but with the understanding that, again, separate realities and realistic expectations in terms of the school. Um, as part of this extended learning plan, very similar to our last meeting, uh, I've invited Dr. Melanie Gates and, and uh, Carolyn Lyons, uh, JD, to join us with regard to uh, curriculum and with regard to special needs. Uh, they are both present, and hopefully you can see them on the screen. And uh, I would ask Dr. Gates to first sort of talk about the process we went through with, with um, working with our administrators at each school level uh, to articulate our plan and get that information out with the expectation that this phase three would begin between May 4th and May 11th, um, and maybe some of the slight differences in between. And, and uh, welcome, Dr. Gates. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch and school committee members and those in the audience watching. Um, We've taken a lot of care in revising our extended learning plan um, in accordance with the guidance given to us from the commissioner. Um, we have engaged a wide variety of stakeholders in being able to refine the plan because we want to make sure that our core values as a district are represented in how we are moving forward during um, these really unprecedented times. Um, you know, we have a highly collaborative team 
um, at the administrative level and our administrators are working diligently with their building faculty um, and staff to make sure that we gather all the input needed to make um, you know, well-informed decisions about how we are supporting teaching and learning during this period. Uh, we have to take great care, not just for our students and our families, but also our faculty and our staff and be cognizant of their own realities as well. Um, the survey that the superintendent mentioned just helped reinforce for us the wide variety of perspectives that are out there, the wide variety of realities that our families are um, engaged with. And we wanna be able to respect that, but we also want to continue to support teaching and learning as best as possible, which was why we took great caution in moving forward with the commissioner's updated guidance where the commissioner asked us to um, explore new uh, new content through what they have identified as priority or power standards. Um, and we've looked at this as, as us trying to continue to engage, engage our learners, not for the, for the sake of mastery of these standards, but for the sake of engaging our students so that they continue to be curious and engaged as learners. Most important for us is that our students do continue to demonstrate the behaviors of a learner. Um, while we are exploring new content with our students, we are you know, not expecting that mastery, but we're gathering what data we can from how our students are performing so that we can ensure that the bridge to next school year is one that's paved for success for all of our students. Thank you, Dr. Gates. I don't know if there are any questions specifically to what you had to say, but I don't see them in the chat. So we'll move on to, to uh, Carolyn Lyons, who's gonna talk about uh, things from the special education point of view. Thank you and welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lynch. So um, I want to echo a lot of what Dr. Gates was just discussing. I can tell you that in this phase three, um, what the process that we're heading into now, you know, our, our goals remain the same. The top priority continues to be the health, the safety, and the welfare of our entire school community. That includes students and families, uh, teachers, and um, in the greater school community as well. So that continues to be the first goal. That's the message that's been sent to us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE. And it continues to be the message we're hearing around the state. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge um, what a tremendous effort this is on the behalf of families. It is not lost on us in special education or in the greater administrative team that in this new model, we are relying very heavily on parent participation and family participation. And every family is different in our community. We have families that are first responders. We have families that are reporting to work day in and day out, and that makes the facilitation of education uh, tremendously difficult. So we recognize that effort and the plans that we've put in place have been designed to have a degree of flexibility to them. Families have to make the best decision for themselves day in and day out, and on some days on an hourly basis with how they're navigating um, the materials that we've put forward and the plans that we've provided. We all recognize that no plan is perfect, and part of that is because every family's need is different. So in the world of special education, we've approached this from an individualized perspective. What I can tell you is the second most important message that we've received from DESE is ongoing communication with our families. Um, administrators and special education teachers in particular have engaged families in a multitude of formats, email, telephone, um, video conference, there's been, there's been ongoing communication with all families about what their needs are at this time and how we can best assist students. And that's going to be continuing. We also developed, as I talked last time during phase two, the student learning um, success plans, the, stu excuse, yeah, the student learning support plans, excuse me, SLSPs, I trip over my own acronym sometimes. Um, and these SLSPs were designed to be a prioritization of goals and services that we'd be addressing during this period of shutdown. The IEPs are still in place. The IEPs have not gone away. The goals are still being addressed and we are still collecting data on progress. So that's going to continue to be in place. With the new guidance, the newest guidance from DESE comes new content and standards and the addressing of standards. And I wanna to touch on something that Dr. Gates talked about. 
Um, it's important, I think, for our community to understand that the federal government advised the state government to address all curricular standards during this period of shutdown. The state then took that advice from our federal government and said to school districts, 300 plus across the state, okay, what we want you to do is actually address what we call power standards, the most important parts of the curriculum. And then Middleborough has taken a step to personalize that even further and adapt it to what our particular community needs. The message has been that we are going to be moving forward to expose students to curriculum. They are not being expected to master this curriculum. It will not be held against them. In the world of special education in particular, students will not be penalized. And I think that's really important. When we all go back to school and what we know of our way of life, we will be addressing these content standards again. So the hope and the design is that nobody will be left behind. I wanna make a quick note about two important programs in our district. When the state handed down what they had in terms of expectations for the so-called power standards, that did not include guidance for our pre-K program or guidance on our postgraduate program. As many of you know, we have students that are in our programming from age three up until kindergarten in our pre-K program. And then we also have students who are 18 or older as students remain eligible until age 22 in some cases. And we run a robust uh, postgraduate program. In both of these programs, there are no changes because there were no power standards um, pushed forward by the state. Our focus at both the age in process and the age out process is maintaining access to services for students and fostering communication with our families. I want to just take a minute to remind our community at large that the full complement of services continues to be available. Special education teachers, related service providers, which include occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, physical therapists, um, counselors, are all working full time in order to best meet the needs of students. Our behavioral department is operational. That includes our BCBA and our RBT, our registered behavior technician, who address behavioral concerns um, for students across the district. I know there's been a lot of question about the extended school year program, and that's been a topic that's remained critical to the special education department here in Middleborough. What I can share is that the uh, DESE, as of last Friday, had informed us that they will not be making a decision about whether or not ESY programs can run until the governor makes another announcement in the middle of May. So unfortunately, we are going to have to be in a place of wait um, until we have further guidance from the governor. I can assure the community that we are still making plans and drawing up contingencies for what the programs might look like. It would be premature to share them because until we really know what we're going to be able to do, they're frankly just ideas. What I can also share with the community is that um, I have engaged the CPAC, our parent group, um, at multiple points throughout the, throughout the shutdown. And um, I anticipate having another public meeting so that families can have their questions answered and we can have a discussion more specifically about ESY. That meeting will be Tuesday, May 26th at 7 p.m. and it will be held um, by a video conference. I haven't yet used StreamYard, but I imagine that's exactly what we're going to be doing, very similar to this meeting. So, uh, Mr. Lynch, I think that ultimately concludes the pieces I have to offer this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, would any of the school committee members uh, have any comments or questions for all three of us? I think Meg had a question to start with, so I'll let Meg go first, if that's okay. I think you're on mute, Meg. Sorry, I thought I was, Sean unmuted me. <laughs> um, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more about how the ancillary services are being offered and how they're being provided to the special ed students? Yes. Um, so in the world of related service, we're still under um, a stay at home order. So there are no in-person services occurring, but related service, have thought very diligently about what methodology is going to be appropriate. In some cases, there is teletherapy that is happening through the use um, of systems like 
um, Google Meet or Zoom. In other cases, related service providers have come up with um, a string of activities that are meaningful to each particular child. And then additionally, I have many related service providers that are participating in um, Zoom or live classroom time performances with, the t with teachers and, and groups and are able to address the needs of our students in that larger context. Anybody who's participated in a Zoom with 15 plus children can tell you for any child, it's very trying, but if you have a student with a disability, you might have particular needs. So our related service providers have been widely available to that. I also have related service providers reaching out directly to families through consult, telephone communication, email communication, and video conferencing. So um, I do want to take a minute to talk about how amazing that, that, what that means. I mean, none of our related service providers have really been trained in um, kind of doing these very hands-on therapies with students virtually. And I want to commend not just the related service staff, but I'll start with them for being just so incredibly flexible um, during this time of crisis. They've all very much prioritized the needs of students and jumped way out of their comfort zones to meet those needs. And I think we are hitting the nail on the head as best as we possibly can with the information that we have at this time. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I think uh, Rich Oakley has a question, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Oaks. Hi. Uh, thanks for everything you guys are doing. Uh, I've I've been hearing in, in you know little bits uh, about the extraordinary efforts you guys are going to make this a valuable um, period of time for students. And along those lines, I wondered, uh, can you talk a little bit about the students that might have less access to tech? Um, you mentioned it a little bit in your um, in your in your remarks. Um, what can we do as a school district and what have we done uh, to try to help them uh, get to a level playing field with the, the students that might have more access? Mr. Chair, I'll take that one. Uh, to answer your question, Rich, through the chair, uh, we have uh, been, actually we did a survey and we asked folks if they needed and if they could get more specific with us and reach out to us. Uh, we've asked teachers to ask and reach out to students and report out through principals. Our tech department has been dispensing units. I don't know, last count, I believe we we're over 30, uh, maybe 35, and sending those out to people who have voiced an interest in getting uh, an additional unit, Chromebook, at home. Uh, all, of our, all of our high school students have uh, laptops that are issued to them uh, via the one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, so we continue to dispense those. Ideally, we'd love to have a, a Chromebook in every child's hand, uh, grades K through eight. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have that. Uh, the question is for some, uh, the efforts on the part of the federal government, the state government are to try to equal the playing field. And if that means buying additional technology and they'll reimburse us, uh, then there's certain something we would certainly do and go to that one-on-one -on -one initiative, sort of K through 12 if we could. Um, like I said, we are nine through 12, but uh, we continue to provide units, uh, to send units out to homes. Uh, we've actually, folks that come to the free and reduced lunch, we, we let them know that if they need units and, and that Ellen Driscoll and the technology department have been responding to that. Um, I don't know if any, if uh, Melanie and, and Carolyn, you have anything to add to that? I would just say that like the rest of the special ed process during the shutdown, it's been very individualized. Um, when we have discovered um, either through our own advocacy or for, through the advocacy of families that there's been a need, we've, um, we've made an effort to meet those needs. In some cases that's meant um, physical packets of materials, it's meant supplies, it's meant technology, it's not specific or exclusive rather to technology. But, um, but I can tell you that this district has been incredibly flexible in trying to figure out exactly what the need has been and then trying to meet that need with resource. Um, and I'm pretty confident that that we've we've done that, um, that we've done that as the need has has demanded. To that end, if there's need that I'm not aware of, or if you're watching out there tonight and you have a need, please don't hesitate to reach out to anybody in the administrative team, um, including our special ed coordinators and me personally, so that we can assist you. That's great. Thank you. Makes me uh, proud to hear things like that. Yeah, well, Rich, Mr. Oakley, through you, Mr. Chair, is, is equity is definitely an issue. Um, 
And even if we, there are some students that even if we sent them units, they would not have the, the uh, network capability to do that. So that's another issue uh, in this town that we have to address, I think, for the long run, is trying to provide hotspots uh, throughout the community. Um, Comcast lists a number of hotspots that are available. Most of them are restaurants um, and, and in some cases, people's homes. Um, and um, the library has been a hotspot and, and people have been able to use the library hotspot. Uh, but for those folks that do not have uh, cable uh, at home or the network at home, uh, that can be a real issue. And, and we could get them as many Chromebooks as we could, but that does not help them. So that becomes sometimes a larger issue. That's a very small percentage. Uh, but it is definitely an issue in some homes. Um, the one question that came up from school committee members while you were talking has to do with how, what are our plans to get the um, technology back or and the books back at the end of the year? That is part, uh, to answer that, Rich, that, that is part of our, what would be called phase four, sort of our operational plan in terms of emptying lockers and emptying student desks. Uh, and getting equipment back to students, athletic lockers and such, uh, but also uh, receiving units back. The, the plan would be at the high school level when the students pick up their cap and gowns and, and their diplomas, uh, they would bring back whatever they owe the school and, and sort of uh, justify with the, the school system exactly what they owe. And, and uh, that includes a laptop certainly for each senior. Um, they would then be reformatted and redistributed within the, within the uh, school community. Uh, but that would be the plan that uh, before they can graduate, basically, they would need to return uh, the laptop to us. That would be the plan at this point. Um, there is a question I could see Brian's further question is, uh, do we let them keep them over the summer? Um, that is not the plan now, but if that's the wish or if that's the desire, if that's a discussion the school committee wants to have, uh, that is certainly something that, that uh, the school system would entertain. And my assumption is whatever social distancing regulations are in effect, that would apply to the returns. So for example, we're not gonna have the entire high school return everything on one particular day. Yeah, that would be probably alphabetized. Uh, tra obviously traffic would be an issue. Um, and, and there's also a, a further question on there about books. Books would be included in that. That's, that's the same category would put the computers in would be the same books. And I would tell you that some of the advanced placement history books is worth as much as a, a laptop to tell you the truth, so. And so I'm going to go to the two questions that we received. I'll go with the first question and I'll read it. I'm really concerned about the kids that have IEPs. Both my husband and I work full time. It is left to our children to access the assignments without our help or assistance. How can you, how can you be sure as a school community that the kids with IEPs are getting the same instruction? And also, will there be extended school services this year? And the person finishes up with, I also understand this is an entire new set of guidelines and in a time we have never navigated before. We're all going through it together. So I think you touched upon it a little, Caroline, but did you want to add anything else to it? Sure. What I want to, let me start with the ESY question because I, you know, I did say that I wouldn't, um, I don't have information tonight about specifically. Whether or not the school buildings are open, there will be an extended year program. So I have no intention of not providing service um, to our identified population over the summer. I'm not sure what that will look like yet, but there is, in any of the ideas, there is no idea of not providing service. So that's the, that's the first question. The question then, the previous part of the question asked about how we can be sure. And I think that's a, that's a really interesting question and I, and I certainly understand where it's coming from. I, I touched on that when I was talking earlier. Um, the IEP process is not a is not a guarantee. You you never know. To be honest with you, if school were in session, you would have no greater degree of surety than than you have right now, because every student progresses on their own track. So the way the IEP process tackles that is to have incremental progress noting and regular meetings, and that individualization that process will absolutely be continuing and and absolutely once we open back up. So. In answer to that particular family's question, you know, any concerns that you're having, I would ask you to touch base, if not with your special education contact person and your special education coordinator so that we can have a conversation about what we should be focusing on right now. Have we honed down your child's IEP to target the most important pieces? 
Um, try to remember that when we all return, everybody's going to have been away from school for a period of time. Um, and that's going to take, you know, effort on the part of the entire school community to meet all children where they're at. But in the world of special education, we would proceed as we always have with an individual analysis just based on your son or daughter and looking at where they were when we last saw them and where they are today. And then we would make a plan going forward, um, which is something that's subject to your personal consent. And to that, end, Rich, I, sure. I just I just want to just say that, that uh, you know, we feel for parents. We understand what they're going through. Uh, we understand their level of frustration. Um, and, and, and I just think that it's important for them to note is, is that we'd love to be able to replicate the school experience at home, but it's simply not possible. So anything we can do to make things easier at home, we will. Um, but uh, our plan is to certainly account for those things as we move forward uh, through the operational plan and through our plans for next year and the summer, obviously, too. So. And I'm going to go to the next question we had, um, and I'll start answering this because it pertains to the school committee, and it's from Bob Sullivan. He said, thank you for mentioning the email I sent you prior to the April 9th, 2020 school committee meeting. However, the April 9th school committee meeting, when you referenced my email, I had hoped you would also reference the main topic of my inquiry, what criteria the school committee will use to evaluate the success and concerns of the extended learning plan. Uh, he included his email from before and added, the rapid transition to remote learning is a significant issue to our students and families. School committee development of criteria to measure success and concerns regarding our extended learning plan can be helpful to our school administration, teachers, students, and parents. The potential of continuing remote learning in some form next year may require additional financial support. Working now with the administration and teachers to develop means to measure remote learning success will help their school committee to make financial decisions that best meet the needs of our student. Um, I will add that I couldn't agree more. Um, when this plan came into effect, I know the four people that you saw in that screen, which is Caroline, myself, Melanie, and uh, Brian, have consistently met with our counterparts across the state via Zoom and via remote learning. Um, and we've continued to have these dialogues with them about uh, what was going on and looking for best practice and, and listening to each other um, in a wide range of topics. From a school committee perspective, it ranged from how do you handle superintendent evaluations? What do you do with extensions of elections? What do you do with um, uh, pieces? I will say this, the criteria established came from the state. It was developed by the commissioner put it out um, we took it and, and ran with the way it is. As far as um, evaluating it, we'll have to do that. Um, we'll have to look at it. Uh, the superintendent mentioned that he already sent out a survey. Um, we will continue to send out surveys to parents and to staff and to have discussions with them. Um, we'll use those uh, pieces in our evaluation. Um, we are continuing to ask people to look at money in different ways and what the needs are. Um, today, um, Brian, I believe it was the superintendent from Fall River had sent a lengthy letter over to the governor's office asking, for example, that um, the mass school building assistance fund be funded in a different way because of the extra money that it was costing us in order to, to um, work on projects. For example, in Middleborough, because of the what the governor has asked us to put in place for the um, program, it's cost us an additional $20,000 a week. Um, and we've established what that money is being used for and why it's being used and are constantly presenting it to the state as added increases. Um, so the criteria um, has to be a member, has to be a conversation amongst the school committee, which will probably happen at our next meeting about what people would like to see. Um, so I'll ask if there any of the school committee members wish to talk about that specific point since it was really addressed to us if anything they wish to add. And I'll ask if any of you on the screen now want to add anything to it, Brian, you specifically. I, I would just add that, that it's our intent as a school system to certainly uh, assess where students are at the beginning of the year. That would give us a great idea uh, exactly where students are um, academically uh, and in some cases, social emotionally. Uh, but I would we would do some some benchmarking assessments and to figure out where students are. Um, it would be unreasonable to think that a sixth grade 
a class would a sixth grade math class would start up exactly where a sixth grade grade math class has always started up, uh, with the understanding that if uh, those fifth graders coming up left school at the end of March and may have completed ST math or done some work, but that sort of assessment piece needs to be done, um, and that assessment piece that those assessment pieces will be coordinated through Dr. Gates and principals, uh, and obviously be reported back to school committee. Uh, so, and that's a manner of, of a manner through which we might assess uh, exactly where we are and, and sort of the how the pandemic affected our, our academics and our social emotional piece. I'd just like to add, if I may, um, Superintendent Lynch and uh, Mr. Young, that it's really hard during this time period to to be precise and analytical with what data we're gathering because of the influence of so many variables um, that are beyond our co control currently. Um, you know, we are looking at the engagement rate with our students. We are looking at um, their completion of the activities. Um, we are looking at that information, but we know that all of that data that we're collected also has a backstory um, of what's going on in the homes um, during this time period. So as Superintendent Lynch said, diagnostic testing next year is going to be imperative. Uh, it's important to us no matter what is a school district, but it's imperative to, to us so that we can be sure to meet our students where they're at and promote growth for all students. The other thing I'll add too is, as you said before, Brian, part of this conversation is making sure that the needs of our student are met. So we are having conversations about devices. We're having conversations about technology. We're having broader conversations about um, what they have for internet capabilities and things like that. Um, I, I think it's it's also a bigger conversation for the community. For example, we're not going to drop hotspots into neighborhoods. That's, that has to be part of a conversation probably with the cable committee. Um, so this is an even bigger conversation as we move forward. Do you agree, Brad? I do agree. I think, um, can I just add sure, one please. thing? Absolutely. You know, it, it, um, assessment is our bread and butter in special education. We're in a constant place of assessment. We have to do that in order to best meet the needs of students on an individual level. Um, you heard Superintendent Lynch touch on it. In the world, in our world here in Middleborough, we address progress and student performance through a whole child approach. So there's a lot that goes into that assessment. Um, certainly academics are part of it, but we're at a place where we're assisting families with meeting basic needs and also social and emotional and mental health and well-being. And that will continue to be a major area of focus. Um, numerous studies have kind of touched on this discussion that, you know, students who have unmet social emotional needs aren't really available for learning. And our district has mobilized to address um, growing and, and possibly increasing social and emotional learning needs, we're anticipating that for our return. So I think that's part of it. Um, what makes this particularly tough is there are a multi multitude of variables that fold into that performance um, outside of a pandemic time, let alone right now. So all I can add is that we'll be using the whole child lens when we assess um, our students, when we get them back in person, as we've been doing during the shutdown. Thank you. I know Mr. Rowe had something he wanted to add, so I'll ask Sean to bump in. Greg? Greg? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sean, for bumping me in. Um, my daughter is in second grade right now, and the MEC, not the MEC, the um, MKG and other, other schools have done this great Google document to kind of guide them in what they should be doing. But now they're asking for evidence on what they're doing and stuff like that. So I don't know if that's mandated by the administration or where it came from, but the fact that they're looking into that now to kind of get a almost kind of like a snapshot of where the student now is impressive. And it's, and I can tell you, having talked to the other parents in that class, everybody's kind of all over the place. And it, there's no, in, until you get that data back, and it's going to take time to get that data back as people accommodate to this. Um, I think it's great that the teachers are looking out for that now, that the, my child's teacher does care what she is getting and what she's missing. So that can be reported to her teacher next year. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think, you know, people are very cognizant about finding and looking for ways in which to survey people and make sure that their needs are being met. 
And the same token, we're going to have those discussions all along. I, I, I do, you know, it's, I think it's everybody here's fervent hope that we can open school in September in a way that we're used to. But if we can't, we're going to plan for every alternative that we need to plan for, for what September looks like. And the Mass Association of School Committees, and I know the Mass Association of School Superintendents have had this constant dialogue since the very beginning about, okay, what could September look like? And let's work out the details of every which way it could go, whether it starts off with remote learning or starts off with split classrooms or starts off with a variety of things. Um, those conversations are ongoing. And I, I think the biggest thing is what ha what's happening now may not necessarily end up happening in the fall um, because people are looking at what's going on now and trying to find best practice over and over again to see what works. And they're really surveying all the school systems to say, okay, what do you need? What's going on? What can we do better um, from a state perspective? And in the few conversations I've had, um, and the conversations I've been a part of, I really have to say the Commissioner of Education is doing an incredible job given what we're in the middle of. Um, and he should be commended for um, just his openness and his ability to have conversations over and over again. Does anyone else have any questions about this particular topic? Um, I would thank you guys for coming and I really appreciate your input as always and I thank you and to the two people who asked us questions I hope we answered them the way you wanted but if not please send us more information and we will continue to make sure that your questions are answered even though they may not be answered at a school committee meeting we can try to get you answers too afterwards so if that's the case so superintendent Lynch I'll turn it back over to your superintendent's report Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Melanie Gates and Carolyn Lyons uh, for their, their considerable input uh, with regard to the entire process. Uh, as we move on here, my, my second item here is, is school choice. And I do, uh, there, on the agenda, it does say school choice seats, and uh, that shouldn't be on there right now, and I will explain. Um, tonight's vote that we're asking from the committee is do we want to continue to be a school choice district? Um, and the question is, is, the information that I'll provide for you is that we currently have uh, 46 students who we take in as school choice students. Uh, this brings roughly uh, a little bit over a quarter of a million dollars to the district. It pays full salaries for at least two teachers and then some um, and provides money from the operational budget. So uh, a quarter million dollars at this day and time comes in very handy for a school system uh, that's going to be really um, at bare bones budget wise next year with a couple of uh, with some changes uh, administratively, et cetera. Um, I would just let you know that tonight's vote is to whether to continue. And I would recommend to you that we do not vote on on seats tonight, on what open seats. And, and I would tell you why. Number one, uh, we've just had kindergarten orientation. Uh, Katie Goodine and Melanie Gates are working on projections and enrollment for next year. But that factors on that kindergarten class. And it also factors on the fact that both Coyle Cassidy and Sacred Heart uh, Middle High Schools have closed. Mm -hmm. And all of those students uh, that belong or that, that, uh, that live in Middleborough uh, may be coming to Middleborough, may not be, but may be. Um, and right now, due to the closure, uh, there may be some confusion as to registration and the registration piece online. Uh, so right now, we're looking at... Uh, some question marks in terms of students coming in. We know we have to be watchful of the high school enrollment. We know we have a building that's being built for 720 students in spite of all the argument that was put in place when we first went to build the building. Obviously that there's more room and there are more classrooms and we can convert some of some, some of the dedicated spaces to classrooms. Uh, but uh, the reality is uh, I recommend tonight that we, we vote uh, on accepting school choice to keep us a school choice district so that we have options. This has to be registered by June 1st electronically with the state. And then we can make determinations on numbers as we get a better idea um, because we don't do lotteries till the end of June anyways. Um, and we do, we did a lottery at the end of June last year and we did a lottery at the end of August last year. Um, that would probably be the intent again as the school committee policy dictates. Um, so we wouldn't need to know exact numbers right now um, but uh, we'll have a better idea 
Uh, once that analysis is completed through Dr. Gates and Katie Goodine, um, and who's our student information management specialist, and get an idea on, on where those students from, from Sacred Heart and from COIL might end up. And if they end up in Middleborough High School, that may push us to the fact that, that we may not be able to take any more students in the high school. Um, so that being said, I would leave it up to a school committee discussion and, and, uh, and your action tonight would be appreciated just so I can then register uh, your vote with the, uh, with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So with that, I'll ask um, Sean to bring up all the school committee members. Um, Brian, I know you have your hand up, so I'll let you go first. I'll start for discussion with a motion to continue being a school choice district. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Again, for the purposes of discussion, um, anyone have any uh, thing they wish to discuss? Uh, Mr. Oakley. Yeah, I just wanted to note for those folks watching that uh, at previous meetings, we've discussed the levels, uh, the sizes of classrooms versus the number of school choice students. And although right now all we're doing is voting to remain or continue being a school choice district, uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Lynch has answered uh, this question previously, maybe even by me, that we're nowhere near any level that would start to negatively impact other students or classrooms. And um, given the the benefits to the district, I, I would I would definitely be in favor of this. No, and I would add that I would agree with that, with the exception of, as the superintendent said, um, he does have con some concern about the um, kindergarten currently. Um, uh, I will say this. I know Greg and I watched the kindergarten orientation last night, Greg Rowe and I. Um, I want to thank Mrs. Linten Lintender because she did a fantastic job. Um, I watched it primarily not because I have a kindergarten child coming, but because I wanted to see how this program worked and what uh, people could expect from a school committee meeting. Um, but there is a sizable number and I think the other thing we need to realize is there has to be at least a little bit of time to look at the Sacred Heart and the uh, COIL numbers to make sure it won't interfere. And that's absolutely the thing we've always done, Rich, is to ensure that kids moving into grades didn't interfere with everybody. Um, what it would do was create a positive piece, which is we were able to add additional dollars to the district and those dollars translated into additional services for all kids um, that we wouldn't normally be able to pay for. Um, in the high school case, it's it's added an additional money in um, the science to help with the MCAS science component. That's a requirement of 10th graders. Um, and so we've looked for bits and pieces over that period of time to make sure that it met um, and helped. Um, so any other comments that people wanna make? Mr. Gimeno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As uh, as I recall, when I joined this group in 2011, um, we were no, we were only a school choice district for grade 12. We've we've slowly and carefully and methodically introduced our school choice all the way down to the to the kindergarten level, and I think that that has been um, one of the assets that we've. Uh, that we can embrace is that we did do it in a methodical level. And now that we're looking at the potential of students coming back and with respect to the, the, the new high school, that we may see students that may not leave for, uh, for whatever reason, just because we have a new high school and the new programs like Project Lead the Way. On top of that, we still have building going on in our community. <coughs> and more and more of these apartments and, and affordable units that are, are, are able to be out there that families can afford that will also bring additional students within to our district, um, whether born into our district or moved into our district. So I think that being a school choice district, absolutely. And then the methodical look when we uh, get a little closer, I know Brian's watching it and uh, we all watch it um, very carefully. So. Um, I definitely, um, definitely uh, want to remain a school choice district. Thank you. I want to bring up one point too that that's really, um, and I know, for example, Greg's been around, Greg Rose's been around for a while, and Brian has, as far as school systems, there was an idea for a long time called senior privilege. And that senior privilege was if you went to school in the town that you lived in and for some reason moved out of it, you were allowed to go your senior year. That senior privilege doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so what we've seen a lot of times is we've had kids 
who had gone to the district through high school, who by issues that have come up, uh, parents have moved out of their home, parents have divorced, they've moved out of district, but still been able to hang with their friends. And if we really wanna talk about social emotional learning, I can't think of anything worse than, uh, than being a kid who went to Middleborough. In one case I know, halfway through the 12th grade and to be told he'd need to graduate someplace else because his, you know, his, um, his hometown was no longer Middleborough, even though he had only had four or five months left to graduate. And so that's the other piece. A lot of these kids, especially at the high school that we found, have been going to the high school for a period in time. And then something happened in the family that needed them to move. And so they applied for choice. We haven't had a lot of kids coming into the district from outside, just looking for a new district. We've had a lot of people who have had family somewhere in Middleborough coming in and being a part of it because it made sense for them. Any other comments? Then there's a motion on the table to approve and become a school choice community. As we know, um, in the virtual times, it calls for a roll call vote. Mr. Oakley. Aye. Mr. Rowe. Aye. Mr. Giovanoni. Aye. Ms. Janess. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. And it's unanimous. Thank you. We'll go back to the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to back up for a moment, if I can, and I put related MOAs. You had an MOA in your Dropbox with regard to ed evaluation for the rest of the year. That has been agreed upon in principle with the uh, Middlebrook Education Association. And I don't know if the uh, if the committee would like to vote tonight to have uh, the chair sign. I know the chair has been authorized to sign in the past. And how you'd like to handle that, Mr. Young, go, goes to you. But I didn't mean to skip over that. That was addition, that was in the COVID-19 and related MOAs. Mr. No chair. Problem. Yes. I would move that we approve the, MO, um, the MOA and authorize you to sign it on our behalf. Joe Harris, second. Second. Um, discussion? Mr. Oakley. Um, I just wondered, uh, just an opportunity for me to learn a little bit more um, in, in the briefest way possible, because I could take this offline with you guys also. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the um, the evaluation process for teachers, because obviously it was MOA. And uh, specifically, who is it that uh, evaluates the teachers? Is it their department chair or how does that work? Uh, I'm going to let the superintendent answer that question uh, because none of us evaluate teachers. So, Mr. Lynch. Uh, through through you, Mr. Chair, and to Mr. Oakley and other members of the committee, uh, I know we have three teachers on the board, so those folks are, are probably very familiar with the process. Um, there is a, a recommended state evaluation tool which contains a rubric of four standards. And we have at the building uh, – Building level, we have principals and assistant principals who are ultimately responsible for uh, the evaluation of the teachers within their building with the input of department heads, uh, the input of teacher leaders, the input of other folks in the building. Um, but it is ultimately the uh, principals, assistant principals, SPED facilitators, uh, the director of curriculum instruction, uh, the pupil personnel services director. Anyone in a supervisory administrative position within the district um, can evaluate a teacher, but it is based on observations, um, whether they be announced or unannounced, and, and monitoring of that teacher and what that teacher does in terms of professional development and how that teacher engages families and also what goes on in the classroom. So it's a pretty detailed rubric, Mr. Oakley. Uh, I can certainly share that with you. Uh, it is something that was recommended by the state uh, I believe it was six years ago, and districts had to negotiate on whether they were going to use the states or adopt the states, or either adopt the states or modify the states. And Middleborough basically adopted the state rubric, uh, which is contained on the Department of Elementary and Secondary website, which is a detailed rubric of, of everything the teacher is expected to do through the course of a year, uh, and in some cases a couple of years, especially if they're a new folk, new teacher. And uh, basically that is done at the building level, uh, by building administrators, and uh, there's a formative evaluation halfway through the year for young folk, for new folks, and a summative at the end of the year, uh, summative for the folks that have professional status, and uh, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated system, uh, but uh, if it's simplified, it's based on four standards that all teachers should be 
really good at it. And if they're if they're really good at it, they're they're graded as proficient or determined to be proficient. Uh, and if they are able to model uh, what they're being asked to do, whether it be through teaching a class or or uh, providing meetings, whether it be a teacher leader or department head, then they can be uh, evaluated as exemplary. Uh, but there are very few teachers who are exemplary. The expectation would be that, that most folks would be proficient because that's exactly what we're looking for uh, is a, a proficient or highly proficient teacher. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question, Mr. Oakley. Yep, it does. Thank you very much. And uh, um, Mr. You're as well. fading it out, but um, go but ahead. Dan Rich, can, can you ask? say that again? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me okay? We can now. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, uh, obviously this is a memorandum of, of understanding, so it, it seems like all parties agreed, but I just wanted to get your take on it. Was everyone happy with this? Yeah, so to be honest with you, uh, you know, I'll be quite honest with you. Um, when most of the negotiations, when we do negotiations, we sit down and have a negotiation. Uh, for things like this, again, this is not something that the school committee is involved with. Uh, this is a, something that the administrators are involved with. So I asked the administrators to get together with the union and put together a, a plan and then to run it by me to make sure I didn't have any problems. And then I bring it to you. So it's it's not like I'm not a part of it, but it just doesn't seem like a piece that makes sense for me to chime in on when I'm not the one uh, doing it. Um, I chime in on it with the superintendent afterwards. We go over it together. We he answers my questions, I answer his. We sort of bounce things back and forth on each other when they meet. Um, but it's not a situation in which I'm sitting down with people and having conversations about it. And, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, this MOA was designed because when we finished the school year technically on March 13th, um, the evaluation process was truncated. So, so we had a process that required so many observations, whether they be walkthroughs or formal observations, uh, and so many sort of visits to a classroom, uh, which were scheduled to occur but couldn't occur because of the time. We still had a couple of months left, two, two, three months left of the process. So what this MOA accounts for is that time span being cut and what this this accounts for for the dates and times and such and, and all the legalese that's uh, required with regard to the evaluation process. Because the evaluation process, quite frankly, uh, determines a great deal. It determines uh, where a teacher is, whether they're a developing teacher, whether they're a proficient teacher, uh, whether they need additional assistance. Um, and also, it's a decision for the, for the district to make whether somebody without professional status uh, should no longer be invited to come back and their contract not be renewed, their individual. So I hope that that helps you understand. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, Mr. Stevens. Yep. So I did look at this uh, because as a teacher, um, you know, we're under a great deal of stress with this new world we're living in, uh, developing new programs, learning new software, uh, adjusting our curriculum, trying to reach students all day long. So I, I think the MOA as presented seemed very fair to me. Uh, I think it gives teachers some space where they can focus on the students and not have to worry about a new you know paperwork that's involved so i, I appreciate the work that everybody did and i think it's very fair anyone else have any comments and mr chair i just want to acknowledge the fact that that um, different folks help out with different projects and this is a project that the the ed evaluation uh piece uh has been worked on with a subcommittee which includes paul brannigan uh, Derek Thompson and Melanie Gates, uh, and they have worked exclusively uh, before my time and certainly during my time uh, to refine the ev educator evaluation process with a group of folks from the Middlebury Education Association. Um, they've been they've, they've developed a great working relationship, an honest, open relationship, uh, and they were able to basically negotiate the basis of this, uh, which was then vetted through our school attorney to make sure that the, the legalese was set. And um, and that's the document that the school committee has before them this evening. So with that, Sean, I'm going to ask you to bring up all the school committee members. Thank you. Um, Meg, I know you were out of the loop for the piece. Did you have any other questions? No, I'm good. Okay. 
So given that, I have a motion on the table and a second. So again, I'll go by roll call vote. Mr. Oakley? Aye. Mr. Rowe? Aye. Ms. Givanoni? Aye. Ms. Janess? Aye. Mr. Stevens? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And so we'll go back to the superintendent. Uh, this next particular piece, um, what we're going to do um, with this piece is we're going to do the tech audit. I'm going to let the superintendent and Sarah um, have it with the, um, the people who did the audit. Um, and then I'm going to ask uh, probably a couple of uh, school committee members to come back at a time, Sean, so they can ask questions of the audit. So thank you. I'll turn it over to the superintendent and, and Sarah. I'm, for this part, I'm going to introduce Sarah Hickey, who's our director of business and finance. Um, as the chair knows and, and the school committee knows, um, we were charged uh, as a school district to take a serious look at our technology department. Uh, we felt the best way to do that uh, is to conduct an audit of the entire department and the entire district with regard to technology. And, and I'm happy to say that, that uh, Sarah Hickey has led this, this effort and is here tonight to sort of inform you, maybe give you a quick summary and then introduce uh, the two folks or at least the one folk. If they're, I'm not sure if both of them are here tonight. Uh, Dave and Aaron are here both tonight. Great, that's great. So uh, they will then present uh, some of the findings of the audit. Uh, Ms. Hickey. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Um, so a year ago or a little bit more than a year ago, I was tasked with finding out um, some information about our technology department. I came into the Middleborough Public School District in the fall of 2018, and I had a lot of questions that I was asking. And I am the money person, and the big question I wanted to have the answer to was, uh, for the amount of money that we're spending in our technology department, are we getting the bang for the buck? And um, that's not a, an easy question to answer. And so I was tasked with finding specialists in the technology field that could come out and take a look at our technology department and do a uh, fair and honest assessment of uh, what we have what are for our assets and what we offer for our students and our teachers. And I was happy to contract with Direct Computer, which is Aaron Heyer and Dave Cawthorn. They came out in, well, we, we started off um, after many, many conversations over many months, uh, we started off with providing them with a boatload of documents and they came out in person in January and uh, ran did some focus groups, had some interviews, spent a couple days um, up to their elbows in the district, and I'm happy to have them here tonight to go over their findings with us. How are you? So again, my name is Aaron Heyer. This is my uh, my counterpart, Dave Cawthorn. Um, together, we've collectively have uh, approximately 50 years experience in educational technology. And uh, we're, we're glad to be here uh, virtually with you tonight and presenting the findings from the technology assessment that we engaged in um, with your staff, your administrators, your teachers, your specialists um, earlier this year. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen with you here. So as Sarah mentioned, we um, we began speaking early in the school year about a technology assessment. And that assessment, when we first started speaking, was largely around infrastructure, um, devices, um, te technology operations. Um, that conversation quickly, quickly shifted. And uh, we were excited about that because both Dave and I are very passionate about instructional technology and, and digital learning. So working together, uh, we were able to create a more detailed assessment plan that, that was very purposeful and would take a look at some very specific um, areas within 
digital, um, from digital learning to infrastructure. So the purpose of the assessment really was to, to look at the infrastructure, look at the support processes, and then help the district determine how it can best plan to support and develop its instructional technology and digital learning initiatives in the future. Again, starting with the foundation's assessment, largely um, you know, device specific, hardware specific, infrastructure specific, and then really refining that process to, to narrow down what we wanted to look at and what the district was most interested in collecting data on. So we ended up settling on um, investigating the technology vision, planning process, uh, leadership, digital learning and technology integration and technology support from a help desk pers perspective, looking at, at break fix and the, the support that the technology department is able to offer. Going right into um, what we learned from this process is, is we really learned that Middleborough is a very supportive community and really supports the district uh, technology initiatives both through the department budget, through the funding of the capital improvement requests, um, and ongoing pa community partnerships, um, including its partnership, for example, with with cable access. Um, you know, from there we we looked at at the district vision and the understanding of the district's vision for the use of technology to enhance curriculum and teaching. Um, we we spoke to many stakeholders and and many constituents in this case and in. We heard lots of really exciting visions for the for the use of technology, but what was clear is that there wasn't necessarily a vision that was was articulated uh, articulated from the district level and that was um, consistent throughout the district. So I'm not going to go through um, the findings specific uh, each individually because I I know that this has been shared with you, um, but I'm going to touch upon. Um, some highlights from from each area of the assessment, and then at the end we'll we'll have an opportunity to answer questions. Some some other findings were that um, both the technology department and other stakeholder groups lacked a clear methodology for selecting and implementing technology. Um, again, this is uh, supported by by data from. Uh, multiple sources from document review to uh, the uh, focus groups from the different constituent groups as well. Um, the district technology planning, um, the, the objectives all consistent with, uh, with the, the district strategic plan, the school plans, um, but really just lacking the strategies necessary in terms of meeting the district's teaching and learning objectives. So, Lots of um, you know planning around one to one and de the deployment of devices, um, but, but really lacking some of the strategies needed in terms of professional development, in terms of digital learning, in terms of um, you know blended learning. The strategies in, in which are used in the classroom, which we use these devices to meet our, our teaching and learning objectives. Um, gaps in the relationship between technology and the curriculum. This is a, a theme that's, that's often um, present in, in K-12 and in higher ed as well, right? So you have your, your, tech, your tech techies, right? Your technology team, and then you have your ed tech. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about this um, later on in the, in the report. Um, lack of instructional technology leadership. So this isn't necessarily, um, one the role of one person, right? But leadership can can present in in many ways, um, and instructional technology leadership is is something that um, there needs to be capacity for throughout the organization, whether it's at the grade level, it's the building level, and the district level. Can, um, in the area of digital learning and technology integration. Um, access to technology and, and hardware and software varies by grade level. We know that um, you're, you're scaling your one-to-one -one deployment and that's a very exciting thing for, for Middleborough. Um, we know that you have one-to-one -one at the middle school where students um, have access to 
devices throughout the school day and at the high school where students are assigned devices in which they take home as well. And that there's various one-to-one um, -one computing opportunities for students at the elementary levels, um, whether that's through tablet devices or laptops or um, in, in computer labs. Um, a limited number of curriculum resources had digital learning experiences and technology integration embedded in them. Um, these were mostly curriculum resources where the digital learning experiences were, were um, implicit or embedded. Uh, for example, the Discovery Ed Tech Book, um, where, where the delivery of the material, the curriculum is, um, is through digital learning. Um, resources and materials. Um, technology integration in digital learning is inconsistent from, from teacher to teacher. So although the, 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 there's consistency with the, del the delivery of the curriculum, the experience for students varied from teacher to teacher, right? So um, a student in, in one, one class with one teacher may have a very um, digitally rich learning experience um, with lots of lots of digital learning opportunities and lots of integration of technology, where in, in another course, it, it with another teacher, it may not be as rich. Um, instructional technology, uh, professional development is is been infre infrequent. And what we heard was that uh, during the early stages of implementation of one to one, there was lots of training, there was lots of professional development, there was some ed tech. Um, type professional development days and PLCs. Um, but in the last several years that those professional development opportunities have been uh, less frequent. And in the area of uh, tech support and help desk, um, there really appears to be an appropriate amount of staff, uh, staffing level in terms of the technology department. Um, the technology department offers an above average hardware and software support. Um, everyone we talked about, uh, just about everyone we talked to said that the response from the tech department was was very good, that the people were very responsive and willing to help. Um, in the review of job descriptions, there were some job descriptions where there were discrepancies between the present level of service, so what people were actually doing um, and what the job descriptions um, in, entailed. Um, I think currently the, the uh, position of CTO the, the actual job description title is technology systems administrator. This is an example of one of the um, job descriptions that would be worth taking a look at. Lastly, um, there really there, there was re really uh, evidence of a disconnect between the technology department and then kind of the instructional programming that really seemed to kind of hinder the implementation of digital learning objectives. So, um, some gaps between the implementation of technology and devices and then uh, the curriculum itself. So what we always say is that the hardware and the infrastructure should really be driven by the curriculum. And the curriculum should not be driven by what hardware and infrastructure you have. Um, and again, we'll, we'll be talking about this a little bit more later in the report. So in terms of the process, um, Again, starting off with the pre-technology assessment, we, we met with uh, stakeholders in the Middleborough Public Schools. We looked at um, really the, our, found, our basic foundations assessment and we went from there uh, really being intentional and purposeful about what data we wanted to collect and what information would be most beneficial to the district in terms of its future technology planning. Um, from there, we went into the assessment stage. We um, conducted focus groups with uh, school principals, district administrators, um, teachers, specialists at the elementary, middle and high school level. And then we went um, engaged in, in uh, several months of analysis and review of all the documentation and policies and procedures and things that were shared with us, as well as the our notes from the focus groups. And uh, that resulted in, in the findings that we just shared with you and uh, the recommendations we'll be sharing. So in terms of uh, recommendations, the technology, under technology vision, planning and leadership, this first recommendation um, 
is is a little bit different. So it's it's to establish a district wide working group to research and recommend the use of technology to improve curriculum and enhance teaching and learning outcomes. And typically when we talk about how this work gets done, we want this work to be embedded throughout all of the planning, whether it's the district strategic planning, whether it's your curriculum review cycle. Um, we, don't, we don't want technology to be thought of as something separate or as something extra or something that you put on top of your curriculum or you put on top of your instruction. Um, but through the conversations and, and through the analysis of the data, what we found is that there hasn't been a lot of communication in terms of um, technology, in terms of curriculum. And we felt that this would be a good starting point to re-engage in these conversations and, um, and, and progress towards having this type of planning and conversation become part of um, your district-wide planning, whether that's again, through curriculum review cycles or your strategic planning or, or school improvement plans. Um, adopting a standard methodology for evaluation, the implementation of um, instructional technology. So there are several, um, you know, uh, ERP or, or resource planning implementation methodologies that have been ad adopted to education and instructional technology, um, really wanting to have a methodology that focuses on creating a, a, a quality, um, positive impact to your instructional program. So, um, you know, many of these these um, methodologies, right? So you're 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 defining requirements, um, you're analyzing, you're planning, you're designing, you're building, you're piloting, right? And then you're fully deploying. And then um, coming back to the the planning stage or analysis stage, right? So, so what's the goal? Uh, where is the need, right? Designing a solution for that need, um, then building the requirements in terms of what technology is needed, and deploying that, and then reassessing, right? So we found that um, often the conversation seemed to be that there was some there was some design happening, right? Or that was um, driven by technology or technology requirements. Um, you know, so really wanting to have a quality uh, methodology in place, right? So where you can, can define a problem and then plan, implement, and then evaluate and assess how things worked out. Um, in terms of recommendations, reconfiguring the organizational structure to increase technology leadership. So again, technology leadership really needs, we really need to, to find a way um, that best meets the needs of the organization to build capacity in the area of technology leadership throughout the organization. So the implementation of technology requires, um, you know, support and leadership at, at all levels, but also an understanding of the educational program, the instructional program, and, um, you know, the student needs, right? So this this leadership needs to be, um, you know, built out through the organization. Um, <clears throat> evaluate and update the technology department positions and job descriptions, really taking um, uh, an inventory of the talent that you have internally um, also looking outside of the technology department and what talents people have and, and uh, whether that's coaching, whether that's providing technology leadership um, and taking inventory of those and, and seeing what you have internally within the organization to offer. Um, establish a five-year capital plan. One of uh, the things that's supported in multiple um, data sets is that people are concerned about investing time into um, building skills or developing skills or materials or professional development because they're, they're worried about the sustainability of the technology model and the funding and having a five-year capital plan, which can be communicated to staff, right, would definitely go a long way in terms of um, buy-in in terms of the staff. Again, building leadership and capacity to design, implement, and evaluate digital learning practices throughout the district. So, 
this is um, within the at the classroom level, the specialist level, uh, the school building, you know, administration, principal level, and district level. Under digital learning and technology integration, uh, identifying a, uh, a model, strategies to be used to help teachers integrate technology. For example, the uh, SAMR model. Uh, build capacity to support innovative technology integration and digital learning practices to ensure support for digital learning objectives. Um, so this is, you know, finding a way to build capacity with technology coaching. We know that you do have some stipended um, technology coaching positions, but in some cases we heard that it's very difficult for these uh, technology coaches to um, uh, get out of the classroom and have time to have consults with other teachers and support um, teachers with instructional practices. Um, implementing targeted dif uh, differentiated professional development, where we talk about differentiating our instruction and personalizing our learning. So as ad adult learners too, um, we often need to differentiate our professional development when it comes to technology, because we have educators that are at all levels of the learning continuum um, we need to be able to best support their learning, right? So we always have our early adopters. They're the initiators, the ones that, that, that are constantly seeking professional development. Um, but then we also have our reluctant adopters. So we need to meet um, our adult learners too, just like our, our students, um, where they are in terms of the learning continuum. So additionally, infusing technology and digital learning into the professional development. So um, building a culture where the technology, again, is not is not separate. It's not something that we add after, um, but it's integrated. And this is a great way to model the use of technology and, and um, integration skills, right, through our professional development. And in terms of not having opportunities, right, to, to provide technology um, integration, professional development, um, there's so many things that we're tasked with doing initiatives um, in, in areas of, of professional development needs. So the integration of this um, professional development into other areas, right, it, it, it's, um, it's essential in, in order to be able to, to get the time to do it, um, but also to provide it in, in an authentic way that builds skills for teachers. Um, establishing positions for, for technology coaches um, you know, we heard from, from staff that um, the, the coaching model, right, modeling and coaching um, lends to the best uh, for them in terms of learning new skills. Um, and we know that technology coaching is, is essential for implementing digital learning. Um, lastly, in the area of the support help desk, um, really evaluate and update all technology department um, positions and, and job descriptions. Again, taking um, inventory of what you have in terms of internal talents and um, areas that people can provide additional support and provide the best value um, and making sure that, that these job descriptions and positions um, really meet your current and, and future needs in terms of supporting your instructional program. Uh, the integration of audiovisual support and personnel. I mean, tech technology and audiovisual, um, they're so closely aligned now that integrating um, support, you know, in this area, whether it's, uh, you know, project, you know, projectors or, or um, digital displays, right? Um, technology staff and, and multimedia support or audiovisual support um, being integrated would, would provide a lot of value. Um, what we heard from the technology staff too was they really want to be more engaged, right? And, and this is something that's so important in terms of keeping technology um, focused on the core mission of the school, which is, which is um, students providing instruction, you know, instruction and learning for students and um, student achievement. So um, this was, was great to hear that the staff um, was wanting to be more engaged in these processes. So taking steps to expand the understanding of the instructional program by all technology department, but also developing a process whereby the technology department can play an integral role in, in all the planning and technology recommendations. And then lastly, 
um, again, adopting a standard methodology for the evaluation and implementation of hardware to ensure that the process um, you know, has an emphasis on program quality and has a positive impact on your teaching and learning program. So in terms of uh, next steps, and um, Dave, you've, you've been awfully quiet here, so <laughs> please feel free to help out. Uh, communicate really. So what should digital learning look like in the Middleborough Public Schools, you know, moving in uh, to 2020? I'm sure that this conversation has taken on a new life um, in the circumstance, under the circumstances we're currently in, uh, but, but also continuing to research, continuing this research, um, continuing this conversation, using these findings and recommendations to inform your future planning, and lastly, to develop, develop the plan. So opportunity for, for questions. Chime in there and just thing that we really heard was that you 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 have a great staff and you have a great group of, of teachers that are really willing to take risks and step out there and go out there and really try to impact students in a positive way. So um, from a culture perspective, I think, you know, you guys are in a great spot primed for something great to happen in regards to digital learning. Um, and as Aaron said, obviously, we've been forced into a little bit more of, of uh, remote learning, which obviously is digital in some capacity uh, for both our students and our kids and and teachers, um, as well as administrators too, right? So, you know, it gives opportunities to leverage that as you move forward with your strategic planning to say, all right, when we're looking at next year or next week, what does that look like? And how can we implement some of these digital learning tools as we move forward? So it was uh, it was exciting to hear the, the great um, things that your teachers are doing in the classroom. And um, I think it, it's, it's a culture that, again, has some great opportunity um, in the horizon for you. Uh, guys, I want to thank you for what you sent us, findings, everything like that. I thought it was fantastic. Sarah, I want to thank you for putting this all together and sort of running the show from your perspective. Uh, the school committee tasked you with this job, uh, so we appreciate what came up. I, I do have a couple of questions before I turn it over to the other school committee. Uh, my first question is around the stakeholders. Uh, and that is from your um, evaluation. Do the stakeholders feel like they're involved in decision-making process for what technology comes into our schools? So I, I think that the, what the data shows is that there's there's definitely a disconnect in terms of what the decision-making process is, is. And I think that speaks directly to the recommendation of um, selecting a standard kind of implementation and evaluation methodology in which, um, you know, you're defining the problem, you know, for instance, or for example, um, you're trying to improve uh, student reading and, and achievement around student reading at the elementary level. Um, you, you, you investigate the problem, um, you, you propose a solution to the problem, right? And then you identify what technology is needed to support that solution. Then you pilot, right, the potential solution, and then you implement the solution if the pilot goes well. But then again, it, it culminates, right, in the reassessment process, right? So you, you make an assessment at the end, did this meet the need? And then you start over. So um, there definitely is a, is, are, is some gaps in terms of understanding, in terms of what the evaluation and implementation process is and whether people feel um, that they, they have a voice in it. Um, in some cases, it, it definitely feels like there, there's definitely not a clear understanding in terms of what the process is. And that was uh, something that the data shows throughout the stakeholder groups, whether it's uh, the technology department, whether it's teachers, whether it's administrators. Um, so again, that's, that, that speaks to the recommendation in terms of developing a, a, you know, a clear process in which you're, you're selecting and implementing um, technology initiatives. And then um, from reading the report, I just wanna, uh, my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, 
from reading everything that you sent to us, I would say, looking at this, that the greatest strengths our technology department has is in its help desk and support services. And maybe the biggest challenge it has is working with technology towards curriculum. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, just about everyone we spoke to feels that um, technology support's very responsive in terms of hardware or software, break fix, um, you know, in, in terms of being able to work within the constraints, whether it's budget, whether it's hardware, and and provide a good level of service and quick level of service. Um, where we see gaps are, are the relationship between technology, whether it be infrastructure and hardware and software, and um, the instructional program, right? The teaching and learning. So how to best close those gaps, you know, I, I think would would it would be a, an area of further research and, and investigation. And that would also come down to your 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 goal setting and your vision and your strategic planning around that, because I think it's really important to know that you're not alone in this in this challenge. And you know, to make the technology components not about the device, but about student achievement is uh, is a culture shift, and it's a difficult thing to go through and to to a understand, but b to be able to figure out how you can you know analyze it, assess it, and be productive and effective with it. So, um, so you guys aren't alone in that in that in that challenge. But ultimately, where the shift in um, instructional technology and digital learning is going is to get out of the conversations about what device do I need and more into the into the idea of what do we need to do to better best impact our kids. And, and the last question I have for you is this. Uh, you've recommended that we review new, different models and um, a different setup. Is that because, in your opinion, keeping the exact same model we have isn't going to bring us to where we need to be? I don't know if it's necessarily our opinion, but I, I think um, when we engage in this conversation, again, the conversation quickly shifted from being interested in knowing if you had the physical hardware and software, right, in terms of a technical standpoint, to what are we doing with it and what is what does our teaching and learning look like in terms of um, embedded instructional technology, embedded technology learning, right? Um, so, so I think you know, from my perspective, it, it seems that the district is most interested in taking it to the next level in terms of what's happening in the instructional program and um, pr pr providing a more equitable student experience when it comes to technology integration and digital learning. Um, you know, one, one of, I don't know how, how much time you've had to review the full assessment report, but uh, with our in our first day or for several hours of our, our, our uh, focus groups, you know, somebody shared with us that in terms of if we look at what students are doing outside of, of our schools in terms of the use of technology, right, um, that they equated, I believe, to, to yelling into an echo chamber, you know, that, that we're still trying to do things um, the way we've always done them. And, and if we take stock and what what students are doing and how they're experiencing things outside of school and learning outside of school, um, that it's time to make a shift, right? So again, I, it seems that um, really that 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 was a focus. Um, there was plenty of conversation about hardware and um, devices and older devices versus new devices and the reliability of devices and infrastructure. Um, but I think that that's something the district you know, has a handle on in terms of planning. I think, again, as Dave said, there's lots of exciting things going on in classrooms with digital learning and um, with technology integration. Um, but, but it's how do we really move everybody again through that learning continuum, right? So you have your early adopters and, um, you know, those are, those are the, the teachers that are always seeking out new opportunities with digital learning. Um, but how do we move everybody you know, through the learning continuum in terms of digital learning. And uh, before I forget, I do want to mention one thing, just because we've had a conversation. Um, because you created this, um, the audit and, and gave us your results, uh, you're willing to continue with us and help us 
and uh, sort of be a resource to help us move to the next levels. You're not just dropping your audit down and saying, thanks very much, enjoy yourselves, have a good day. No, absolutely. And, and again, so Dave and I, um, we work both uh, with with instruction, and digital learning, and the hardware and, and hardware and infrastructure. But we also work with a number of other consultants too that can provide expertise in, in any given area um, in the K twelve technology environment. Great. I'm going to ask Sean to open it up to other members of the school committee. I think he's going to bring in Greg and Rich, and I'll ask you guys if you have any questions. Greg, if you want to go first. Um, I was impressed with the depth of the audit. Um, it was really all encompassing and that was fantastic. Um, I don't really have any questions. I'm just gonna kind of watch Rich go away with his questions and enjoy the show. <laughs> all right, so Mr. Oakley, you're up, my friend. What, do I have a reputation or something? <laughs> anyway, um, um, much Aaron and Dave this has been really great and, and when I was reviewing the tech audit ahead of this meeting um, it, you kind of just answered this but I, I'd still like to address it um, just for my own education I'm kind of the new guy um, here so um, be, you know before I heard your answer a few minutes ago that the focus was more on the um, the organizational setup of our tech department the um, this kind of structural way that we evaluate and the leadership um, I was kind of just, I, I'm kind of a tech guy myself and I was, I was, I was waiting for, you know, some questions about, you know, Chromebook versus like windows based laptop and, and um, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts and the um, server tech and stuff like that. But I think I understand now um, that you feel pretty comfortable with our handle on the actual devices and hardware. And so my main question is, um, it does this, evaluation that you did for us look like the evaluation that you do for other school districts or are you sometimes much more focused on hardware than you were with us so often the process is much more focused on on hardware right because we're working with districts that um that have deficits in that area right and that's what the specific conversation starts with hardware as a foundation and um as I'm presenting this to you, it, it's funny, we're talking about the foundation's assessment. This is really not very similar to any foundation's assessment we've done because it is much more comprehensive and much more focused on the digital learning and instructional technology and, and planning and leadership areas than it is hardware. Um, so, so, but these audits and these assessments, again, th they're designed to provide you with the, the most amount of value. Um, because of the conversations in, in that pre-assessment stage, we were able to really focus in on what the biggest or the most, the, the biggest area of interest is, and then try to provide you with the most, most value in those areas. In terms of the findings, um, it is really important to understand the process to, to read through the assessment and know what the objectives are of the assessment. Because although they, they do stand um, they do stand alone, right? In terms of the the, uh, the findings and recommendations, um, they're very very purposeful and they're very direct, so that you can they can provide you with the most direction and the cl clearest understanding in terms of as you enter the next stage, which is that planning stage, right? The continuing of research and then planning for what the next steps are in terms of what is digital learning? What does technology look like? And what does it mean here in Middleborough? Um, so it's, it's easy to talk about um, a, lot of, a lot of hardware or a lot of digital learning, right? And then make recommendations and findings. Um, our findings are, are pretty sharp because we want them to be very, very helpful for you in your technology planning process. And, and we think it's also very important that um, that you go through the planning and evaluation process prior to having the hardware conversation, because the hardware conversation is one that you can really kind of take you off off task and off track and, and throw you into a, you know, a, a bunch of different, you know, avenues to, to be able to pursue. So I think it's really important that the, the foundation gets built first and then identify the problems and the needs that you have. And then you can take a look at, okay, now that we can identify where we wanna go, now it's what are we, how are we gonna get there? And then that's when the hardware conversation can come back to the table. 
but we, we feel very strongly about you need to have that foundational conversation first and develop that organizational structure from the top down that's really supportive of the vision and the, the direction that everybody, the whole Middleborough Public Schools is gonna, gonna journey through together. So I think that that's really important. Really, really too, just shifting the conversation from the devices, from the word technology, from gadgets, right? To learning, right? That That's core to the mission, right? That's, that's what we're doing every day with students is about learning. So by using terms like digital learning or instructional technology, it's something that is core to what we're doing and is, is universal in terms of, of language. It's, it, it's in line with the language and the conversations we're having everywhere else. So we talk about technology. Sometimes you'll have teachers or, or students, right? Or, or, or um, support educational operations or support staff that say technology, I'm not good at technology, right? It's like, I'm not a good reader. I'm not good at math, right? So it's part of the learning process and using terms when we're talking about learning, teachers understand talking about learning. Um, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I just had one more question, um, and it, it's uh, really directed at, at you, Mr. Chair. And I just wondered, I, I saw a mention of a three-year plan in there, but um, it, I, I think I've been on SchoolCom for a couple of years now, and I, I hadn't heard about that. I just wondered if you could address what that three-year plan was about. Yeah, so uh, we don't have that three-year plan. Um, the um, I've checked, and thankfully, Mr. Giamanobi had said some um, – information to me because I had asked him to um, we the three-year plan that they were given was uh, 2019 to 2023 um, it was uh, uh, we haven't seen it so it may be something internal from technology uh, but it hasn't been something that was shared with the superintendent or myself okay thanks so any other questions, Greg or Rich? Then I'm going to ask Sean to move you out, and we'll move in um, uh, Brian and Meg. And Brian, I apologize, because I know that was going to be your next question. But we'll go with you next, Brian, if that's OK. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first thing I want to do is uh, when we start talking about technology. I wanted to acknowledge Aaron's mobile office. Great mobile office, great idea. I'm thinking about doing the same thing. I'm thinking mobile office, really mobile is great. Um, during the entire presentation, the word lack came out quite a bit. And uh, I, I, I appreciate an honest evaluation because that's what we're looking for. You know, a lot of evaluations, sometimes uh, someone hires someone to do an evaluation and the evaluators just tell you what, you know, what that person wants to hear and, and, and pat you on the back because we've spent a lot of money. We've done, done a lot of technology upgrades. But the biggest thing that I heard today was curriculum drives hardware. It's not, hey, we need to go out and get a bunch of hardware. It's curriculum should be driving the hardware, which I thought was, uh, it, it, it sounds simple, but it just, it clicked in a certain way. Um, when I read, when I read the, the, the audit, I, I went back and I and I did a search and I did find that 2013 to 2017 report that was um, it was finally approved I believe on September 4th of 2014 uh, because I, I I do keep track of I keep all my my uh, all of my uh, drop boxes and I and I was looking at that technology report from back then I was hoping that I had the 2019 I didn't have it because um, I really want to see what the vision in the 2019 technology plan that we draft technology plan because we haven't approved it yet. What it is actually in there? I'd love to see the vision because we keep talking about lacking things and we talk about we have to make sure we have the right vision. Those two things came together a lot during this presentation and it really it did it did concern me. Um, I think that uh, the the comment of I was looking at you know the same thing on hardware, Chrome versus Windows. I've been talking about that for a long time. And then I just said to myself, you know, put that aside because once again, you go back to a curriculum driving the hardware. So I think that we've got a first step here. I think we really have a second step. And uh, being the short term guy, uh, I'll only be here for another month till the, till the next election, month and a half. But um, we've got some steps that we can make moving forward 
um, even during this uh, this this uh, situation that we're in right now. But I'd like to really work on um, filling in those gaps in that that uh, tech tech uh, curriculum, those gaps that were just mentioned. I think we can work on that and that that uh, that instructional leadership piece. I think that that's the other one that we could really work on. And, and if we do that, um, we're going to literally we're going to use our technology that we have, but we're going to turn this around, I think. And as we turn it around, um, we can let that that uh, curriculum to drive that hardware. And I just I, I, I heard those words that really, really resonated with me. Um, and, I'm, and I'm glad that they're here to make this presentation. So I, I don't have a question. Um, other than I'd love to see the 2019, 2023 uh, uh, technology plan. Other than that, um, I'm going to pass it along to Meg and uh, let her uh, ask some questions. Thank you. Right ahead, Meg. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I just wanted to, it's not really for um, you guys, but maybe more so for um, Mr. Lynch. So going forward, what, when I was reading through it, I just saw that there was a lot of, um, the teachers felt that they didn't have the support that they needed. Um, so yes, we're lacking some things at the district level, but we need to really focus on the teachers and supporting them in the classroom. And now that we're in this kind of virtual world, if we could identify some people that have done this very well, maybe we could um, have them do some PD around things that they did during this time, but definitely looking at how we can support the teachers moving forward. So Meg, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Greg talk next, and then I'll bring back Brian with Sarah for their comments, if that's okay, and I'll ask him to answer your piece. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So Sean, I'll ask if we can go to Greg. And Greg, I want to make sure you've got your questions in. Thank you. Um, yeah, looking through this report, I mean, there's obviously a lot of information to digest uh, very quickly. Um, but I think... The thing that really struck me was page 49, I think, of your report, where you do your strength and weakness um, summary, which I thought was good. Uh, I just want to say, I think the strengths and opportunities that you listed out, I, I agree with. I think everything looks good. The threats, I don't feel, I'm not as worried about that because, you know, as a school committee, we do a budget review every year. So I think a lot of your threats, I'm not so worried about. But the weaknesses really stood out to me. Um, if you could talk more, like, I, I just feel like that it, it just seems to jump off the page that, like uh, Brian Gimononi uh, mentioned before, was lack of methodology for selecting and implementing uh, technology hardware. Um, it, you know, it just seems like the planning part, technology planning, well, that's a big deal that if we don't have that, that, that and so I would get like your, opinions on how do we fix like those weaknesses I think we should address immediately because the other things like the threats will follow if we fix those weaknesses then I think those threats go away well so I would, if I you would, could speak more on the weaknesses I'd appreciate that I, I would I would jump in and and say that um, you guys are in a pretty good spot in terms of you know being taking a look at how you can start to implement some transformation and, and, and change in culture um, will help you de start to develop that methodology for selecting and implementing based on your curriculum conversations. And again, I think the reason that we highlight that, um, we, we do have some, the data from our, our focus groups mentioned that, um, but it also is that without that connection between that hardware and that curriculum piece, is that you, you really kind of just spin and you don't really move anywhere. So that whole piece of being able to really develop a plan that says, this is what we need to do from an instructional perspective, and this is how we're going to do it, and this is the, the, the methods that we're going to do to select and, and analyze it and implement what we're going to try to do, and removing the word technology out of the conversation um, and making it more uh, a teaching and learning conversation and, and embedding digital learning into that. So, you know, I think that is, is, the, is the direction that we feel like every school district obviously needs to be looking at those avenues to be able to really impact student achievement in those ways and to develop that. So basically that weakness piece is the way to, hey, we need to develop a plan to address this 
and they're basically the steps that 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 all go in hand in hand to make that happen. Thank you. If that answers your question. It, it does. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Greg, do you have any more questions? Um, I just want to clarify that um, the three-year report that the plan that came in was did, did not come through this committee and did not go through the superintendent. Correct. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So, Sean, if you bring in Brian, um, I just want to give Brian and Sarah a chance to make any comments that they want. Well, I'll, I'll start and let Sarah finish. Uh, but I would say that that uh, I think on page 49, Greg, you're exactly right. That that page is to me is very telling in terms of this analysis, and it focuses on on four areas. Uh, one being technology leadership, one be te te technology planning is the second one, technology professional development is the third, and in the terms in terms of uh, selection and implementing technology, it's that sort of the methodology piece. Though, so it's it's also a planning piece, but it's also the the technology that we're purchasing, making sure it's being purchased with with the curriculum in mind. The curriculum needs to be driving uh, the technology purchases. So that's sort of the the, the piece that I focused on. Um, uh, to answer Meg's question or to try to, to answer Meg's question, and, and certainly I can clarify for if I don't, um, but the, the the idea being that once we take a real deep look at this uh, full analysis, which we received this week, uh, we then will, as far as I'm concerned, we'll take actions uh, as a district. And uh, if we need to redesign the department, we'll redesign the department as recommended. If we need to take a look at leadership and technology in the district, we'll take a look at technology and leadership. It's clear that we need to do that. Um, if we need, we need to take a look at the planning that's gone on and the planning that needs to go on, and we'll need to address that, certainly. Uh, we'll look at professional development. As Aaron mentioned, we had an incredible year three years ago when we put in the one-on-one -on -one devices, or four years ago when we put in the one-on-one -on -one devices, and we had a full year of, of curriculum um, technology uh, professional development. And we have definitely dropped some of that off. We have renewed that. Uh, Sean Siciliano and Melanie have put together a, a nice a program for teachers right now during this digital age here uh, for workshops that they can go to and, and look at um, and develop professionally. And then that last piece is that sort of methodology for selecting and implementing technology. Uh, that is something that the process is something that we have to redesign as a school district because if it's, if it's the, we're going about it the wrong way clearly and uh, we need to readdress that and reassess that and, and plan for the future so uh, it's definitely a call to arms here in terms of what we need to do as a district um, to effectively implement technology uh, a budget as sarah mentioned and characterized at the very beginning uh, that's a very large budget and it needs to be uh, a more effective budget uh, obviously uh, with this report and and it's something some of the things we already knew going into the report but uh, I can let I can hand it over to Sarah if you'd like, Sarah. Please. Thank you, um, Meg. To address your question, uh, as you read through the report, um, one of the comments in one of the focus groups with the teachers really jumped out at me, and the teacher said that the administration has high expectations. And um, when I saw that, I said to myself, "Yeah, um, our students deserve the best." So do we have high expectations? Definitely. And as you know, Meg, I was a, a teacher for a long, long time. And I really got your, your concern about the support part for the teachers. And I look at this audit process and the results of this audit as being the beginning of a very deliberate building of uh, more support for teachers so they can assist our students um, be the very best they can be. So um, I hope that if that answers your question. Um, and let, if it's okay with you, I'm going to bring back the school committee members for a portion of this right now, if that's okay with everybody. So Sean, I'm going to ask you to bring back school committee members. except for Greg, who's just coming back. We'll, we'll give Greg a minute. 
So I'll wait for Sean to find out if Greg's in there. Um, what I wanted to say was, in my mind, um, this involves two processes for us. Um, the first is the easy one. Uh, and that would be that the chair would recommend that we approve the tech audit as presented to us this week. Do I have a motion for that? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the tech audit as presented. Thank you, Brian. Do I hear a second? Second. Um, discussion of that? Mr. Chair? Yes. I would love nothing better than to get that tech audit out to the public if they wanted to look at it. It is, it is a great document. And as Greg Stevens did point out, the SWOT analysis on page 49 um, it sums it up. I would also love to get a copy of the presentation that the uh, the team put together and gave us tonight, the, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides. That is... Uh, very to the point, and I think that that would uh, go a long way if the public really wants to know uh, all 18 of them that are watching right now, if they, if they want to see it as well. We're up to 24 at one point. Mm -hmm. So um, I agree with you, Brian, and we can ask that they send that over to us and we'll make that available as as Any other questions about the motion to approve the tech audit? Um, seeing none, um, it requires a roll call. Mr. Stevens? Aye. Mr. Oakley? Aye. Mr. Giovanoni? Aye. Ms. Janess? Aye. And Mr. Rupp? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The second is the more difficult one, and that's this. The school committee put into play the idea of a tech audit. We wanted a tech audit, and we received one. Given the results of the tech audit, my suggestion would be to take a motion from this committee asking that the superintendent redeveloped the tech department given no moved do i hear a second second mr Discussion. chair yes mr chair we we asked for something specific we wanted an audit done we wanted to look at this we we brought we brought in experts i think that it it, it would be the in our district community's best interest to do this uh, give the uh the superintendent who i have the utmost confidence in i have so much confidence that he'll put together a group and really reorganize the the the, the tech department in such a way that we're moving forward as a district and i would also add that this um this is not a plan that we're putting together this is a plan as you said brian they would put together and present to us at another time mm -hmm. we're still uh, sort of open about the budget for next year. And this is a big department that costs a considerable amount of money. So it makes sense. Greg, I know you had a question. Well, I just want uh, make a comment about that. Um, yeah, I totally agree with the reorganization type thinking because it seems like all their concerns have to do with the, you know, planning and structure. And with the new high school coming on the line, we don't want to waste that resource because there's going to be a lot of functionality there that we just, have to you know make sure it's being used to the uh, maximum uh, use of the students. So I'm fully in favor of this. Any other comments or questions? I would say also that in the conversation I had with the two gentlemen, um, both have been involved in uh, putting new high schools online and new buildings online, and they had um, they had uh, great knowledge and again are willing to help and willing to. Uh, be a part of the next steps if we need them to. So I think that's important. So unless there are any questions, the chair will um, ask for a vote. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Uh, Mr. Oakley. Aye. Mr. Giovanoni. Aye. Ms. Janess. Aye. And the returning Mr. Rupp. Aye. And the chair votes aye, it's unanimous. So I'm gonna go back to everybody uh, with Brian and Sarah and the two other people, if that's okay, Sean. Sean's very good at following directions, so I really appreciate Sean. So uh, again, I want to thank, I can't thank you guys enough. I appreciate what you've done for us. Um, and um, I, I, I'm going to make an assumption that we're going to be working together in the future. Great. So, so again, we just, um, we want to say thank you for this opportunity. We really did enjoy it. Uh, it, it, it was a uh, a great experience to get to spend some time with your staff and your teachers. And I, I do want to want to close on again, there are so many great things happening in the Middleborough public schools and, and the things that teachers are doing with students and using technology. Um, 
are, are amazing. Um, and, and again, this is a, a great stepping off point in terms of planning and really just being intentional ab about those things that are happening and, and spreading that, um, you know, conversation in terms of digital learning, in terms of technology, uh, and, and really being able to, to move the district to that next level. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Appreciate it. And Brian, I'll let you turn it over to continue the superintendent's report. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I would just close by saying um, well, we, myself and Sarah were here and obviously administrative team, many administrative team members are tuned in and, and we heard you loud and clear in terms of what we need to do. And we will respond to this report accordingly and plan for the future. I don't know, Sarah, have you any closing thoughts on that? I would just like to echo what you just said. I agree with everything you said okay and the next item sarah is yours again it's negotiations with vendors if you have any updates just a, a quick update um the i spoke last time about the uh, contract with first student that we the department of education had grouped all of the districts that used um used for student together as a group to negotiate as as one large group and my personal opinion about that is the 40 districts put together was just too many people and the strong the people that that, that ended up in charge of the negotiations um were pretty much saying we're not going to pay we uh, my mayor won't let me pay my town uh, council won't let me pay. And um, I had had conversation with Superintendent Lynch. And one of the things that we talked about is that Middleborough has a great relationship with the first student company, that we we're happy with the work they do for us. And we, we value them as a, a partner. And we're in going into a year four option for um, our contract, but then the following year, so not next spring, but the spring after, we're going to go out to bid for a contract again. And, and we'd like to preserve the relationship that we have with first student. So um, I, through conversations with other school business managers in our local area, found out that other districts were feeling the same way. And so I'm now part of, I don't know how to describe it other than to say I'm part of a splinter group where we're um, going to be negotiating separately with first student in order to um, compensate them for readiness so that when we need the buses up and rolling on the day that we need them to pick up students that they'll be there for us. Um, and I will keep you posted on that as we continue with school committee meetings. The second thing I wanted to say is that um, another area where there's been a lot of conversation at the state level is with the payments for out of district placements and the Office OF, OSD, the Operational Services Division, sent out a letter um, saying that uh, the tuitions to out of district placements were non negotiable and that if services were being offered, we were to be paying them. And so I think I told you that we would be, uh, my, I'm working with Carolyn Lyons and we're collecting up. Uh, documentation of the services services that they're providing and so that we can pay appropriately for those. But there is a, uh, a letter going out from many different school districts and um, joint letters with their it, superintendent, school committee, um, town accountant, town managers going to the state about the actual rates that the um, the out of district placements are charging. So the, the rates get determined by the operational services division and those rates take into, uh, uh, take in a lot of consideration into, um, 
things like the electricity that it costs to run their buildings. Well, they're doing remote learning now, just like we're doing remote learning. And so we're looking at uh, different different um, districts are looking to have some sort of adjustment from that. So I have to catch up on all my reading. I did get probably 50 to 60 emails about that today. And I will check in with you about that next time we speak. Thanks, Sarah. I just want to bring up one point. Um, I know I shared with you and Brian a letter from a member of town that I got, got and I shared it with the school committee. I, I just want to be clear. Yes, we had a great relationship with first student, but we know first student has laid off their bus drivers, but we have no control over that whatsoever. Correct, Sarah? Yes. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure people understood that, that they are not our bus drivers, even though they're driving the buses that say Middleborough. Um, they're employees of first student and what first student does with their employees, we really have no control over at this point. And the point through you, Mr. Chair, and to you, Mr. Chair, from, from that individual was that that we should be in a position where we're we're answering, we should answer to that union of those drivers. And, and we don't, we can't deal with a, that union of drivers because that union of drivers is, is signatory or, or has a collective bargaining agreement with first student and not the Middlebrook Public Schools. Mm -hmm. So we do not want to get involved in that. Yeah, just wanted to bring that up. <clears throat> okay. Next on my agenda, if we're moving on here, is is uh, a food services update. And I just wanted to, I know that the chair asked periodically, uh, almost, I think, I believe on a weekly basis. And I want to bring you up, the community also up to speed on what we're doing. Uh, beginning on Monday, March 16th, the food services department began serving grab and go breakfast and lunch meals out of the Henry B. Birkeland School. And it was open to all students and all families in Middleborough. Over the past eight weeks, we've served well over 8,000 meals, currently average, averaging well over 200 per day. With the help of the minivan drivers, uh, we've begun delivering to those children who do not have any transportation. Uh, we're currently we're delivering to 24 children in the community. Uh, we'll be continuing to serve meals to our students until the end of the school year, at least. Um, you do not, folks at home do not have to sign in to receive meals. We will be at the Berkeley School Monday through Friday between 9 and 10 uh, on a daily basis, obviously, Monday through Friday. Uh, we have also, this food services department has also began, uh, begun uh, refunding lunch money to seniors, uh, high school seniors, and other students leaving the district. Uh, if any family is in need of a lunch refund, they can send an email to the first food services department, care of Rebecca Bagnell, or call the office. The refund will be in the form of a check and will be sent regular mail over the course of the next few weeks. Those are people that might have money in accounts that want that money back prior to the beginning of next school year, um, and, or they can find out exactly, they probably know exactly how much they have in their account uh, through through uh, communication with the food services. So that's just an update from food services. Uh, if anybody has any questions on that, I, Mr. Chair, they would go through you. Uh, anyone have any questions? Uh, currently, I see no one, so we can move on. Okay, my uh, final item on my uh, agenda tonight is the Student Opportunity Act, and I just wanted to point out that through the 2015 Foundation Budget Review Commission uh, had certain provisions in it that benefit our public schools. Uh, they were acted on last year in the Chapter 132 Acts of 2019, um, and as part of that student, what's called Student Opportunity Act, uh, there was a requirement on the part of school districts to submit either a short form or a long form, uh, what's called a student opportunity plan. Uh, again, it's a three-year plan, evidence-based, and it's aimed at closing persistent disparities in achievement among student subgroups. Uh, application guidelines and samples and templates were recommended by the Department of Elementary Secondary Education. They asked for short and succinct plans. Um, the Delineation between short forms and long forms was $1.5 million. Uh, as I've described earlier at school, me school committee meetings, uh, this uh, massive amount of money through the Student Opportunity Act uh, go is going most, the majority is going to 35 communities. 85% of the money in Massachusetts is going to 35 communities. Um, we happen to be a community that uh, received $90,000 or $30 a student times 3,000 students. And uh, that is the same extra money in Chapter 70 that we've received for the last four years. So we have not seen a windfall from this. We have not seen a tremendous advantage. 
um, in planning with, with Dr. Melanie Gates on this matter uh, with regard to the student opportunity plan and looking at our greatest need in the district. Uh, we decided to put our student plan, our student put our student opportunity plan together based on our uh, sheltered English, our English learner education program, uh, which as you know, after John Cardoza, the teacher left, um, we had a coordinated program review that came in from the state and made very specific recommendations about how we could do better with that population. So our plan is reflective of that. Um, it is a short, succinct plan, but basically, uh, states that we need to uh, expand to two teachers, which we've done, uh, which is in place. Our population has doubled since 2014. 2014, we had about one half a percent of our population. And at, at this point, we have about 1% uh, or about 30 students in our population of, of ELs or English learners. So this plan is reflective of uh, that expansion of that program and also the addition of curriculum pieces, which we've budgeted for and we'll continue to budget for. So that is that specific subgroup that the student opportunity asks us to, to target. And we have decided to do that with this group. Um, that plan was, was dropped in the, in the Dropbox today. I don't expect you to be versed in it, but just to describe to you that that is a plan that we need to submit to the state, uh, be accepted. They, like I said, they've asked for short, succinct plans. And with our level, the, the, the level one, uh, under 1.5 million or $90,000, uh, this is the plan that we put together. It does require a vote for you. It is in draft form to you. If you'd like to review it further and, and move on at the next meeting, uh, that's fine. This is a draft form. It just needs to be finalized through Dr. Gates and myself, um, but it will basically be what you see before you, uh, just on letterhead and, and with some boxes checked. Uh, we need to uh, re-engage with the subgroup being the parent group, uh, which we meet with on, on a regular basis, and we will re-engage with them and uh, send them this plan and do a Zoom meeting with them and, and get their okay to submit it to the state. So that's where we're at. It's a student opportunity plan based on a subgroup as defined by the Department of Elementary Ed in Chapter 132 and um, of the, the Student Opportunity Act. Any questions? Anyone have any questions for the superintendent? Um, seeing none. Brian, anything else under the superintendent report? There's nothing. I just I, I know that you're going to vote on this later, perhaps, or or. Just... Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to bring everybody else up to sort of run through the sure. rest of the meeting if possible. Sure thing. You have something else for superintendent report? I do not. Okay. Uh, Rich Oakley, you have a question. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Superintendent Lynch, I, I just wondered if if you could help us um, understand maybe any any guesses as to why we got so much less or, or so much less than we would have hoped um, for, from this um, compared to other communities in the state. Well, I would say, uh, Mr. Oakley, through you, Mr. Chair, that um, it's a frustration that I've expressed at, at a number of meetings. Um, we're a community that was not identified as uh, as somebody that has we do we're not a, this was based on free and reduced lunch and the numbers and percentages. Uh, most of this money went to larger cities, it went to Brockton and Fall River and New Bedford and Worcester um, and Lynn and Lawrence and, and major cities, Pittsfield and Springfield, and uh, very little money went to most communities. There were some communities around us that received more. Uh, hard to explain why, uh, but. Uh, this is the $30 a student that we've been receiving for the last four years, which is added to our chapter 70 money that comes into us. Um, so it really is, it was not a, a positive impact on the budget other than to say that if it were left out, it would be a negative impact, but it is something that for the last, this is our fourth year in a row that we've received the same amount of money. So the Student Opportunity Act uh, did not provide Middleborough with any additional uh, financial uh, incentive or financial money. So, so we, we could not add major programs. We had to feature a program that already existed uh, because we could not afford to add a program. Rich, I'll also add that um, the educational um, piece was voted on after the budget. And this is part of the reason they didn't add a whole lot of extra dollars to it this year. Uh, the hope is those dollars increase as as time increases, but again, that was before everything that happened. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Lynch? That is it, sir. Okay. Then chair. I'm going to ask Sean to bring up all the school committee members if that's possible.
So um, the first question I'll throw out to everybody is, do you want to just approve the um, Student Opportunity Act plan? Greg. Um, I'm just, I don't see the file. He said it was added to our box. Anyone else having that same problem? It's there for me. What's it called? It's, is it in the superintendent's it, report? It, on the superintendent's report, it's draft MPS Su Student Opportunity uh, Act, short form. I got it. I, uh, my Everything was condensed, so I couldn't see the right. Uh, okay. No problem. We've all been there. <laughs> it's, it's a huge document of about three pages. <laughs> three pages. They'll take me three seconds. Okay. Any other questions about that? Because uh, I'll I'll take a motion while Greg's looking. I would move that we uh, authorize the superintendent uh, to submit the student opportunity plan for 2021 through 2023 when it's finalized. Uh, since we've received this draft, and uh, I don't see it changing much from that. Do I hear a second? A second. Discussion. I'm hearing none. All those. In, oh, I got a roll call. Right. Mr. Oakley. Aye. Mr. Rowe. Aye. Ms. Giovanoni. Aye. Ms. Janess. Aye. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Aye. And the chair votes aye. I almost made it through a whole meeting with the roll call thing. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, next up on the agenda is consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda that has been presented this evening. Second. Second. Uh, for discussion, just so everyone at home knows, the consent agenda is just our meeting minutes and the approval warrants, which have already been signed. Uh, it goes through the, all the school committees to take a look at each um, each meeting. Um, so I'll go through the roll call vote again. Mr. Oakley? Aye. Uh, Mr. Rao? Aye. Mr. Giovanoni? Aye. Mr. Janess? Aye. Ms. Stevens? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, to be quite honest with you, for MSBA, we haven't had a meeting and from our last meeting. I believe we have a meeting next week. Am I correct, Brian? I believe we do have a meeting next week, Mr. Chair. And if people go on to the Middlebar Schools website and they click down to the, uh, the webcams, they're going to notice there's been a lot of work done uh, on the project. At, and if they go further down, they can watch some of the YouTube videos. There's, I think, nine of them right now that, that uh, shows all the progress that's being made. It's beautiful to see the, uh, the band room. Uh, the auditorium is being kind of finished off and insulated at this time. It's just a great project that's moving forward. And the parking lot is ahead of schedule right now. We just we're, I talked to Brian Lynch about this a little earlier. So it's a, it's a great thing. This project's moving forward, and I'm excited to see uh, – Geez, maybe the maybe the seniors can graduate out of it. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> oh, we lost Bridge. I, Megan, I think you're in charge. I think you're in charge, Megan. Okay. Um, superintendent <laughs> evaluation. Um, I don't know what he was going to say about that. I would assume it's on hold. Um, so I guess we'll come back to it or whenever he gets back in. Oh, there he is. Are we, we finished, Rich. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> so, uh, but that's not bad, considering uh, we've only lost Greg and I for a very short portion of time yeah. during this. Um, so that's great. Thanks for finishing, wrapping that up um, for the MSBA. The oh, superintendent Mr. Mr. evaluation. Oh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, there will be a new video on the MSBA project, the, the high school project, this Friday. I think I just got a little something from Sean that this okay. Friday there will be a new video up. Fantastic. Um, next on the agenda was the superintendent evaluation. Um, the superintendent will be selling, sending the packets. He's been a little busy <laughs> to outline it. Um, so we'll be working on that um, prior to town election. Um, uh, and then we've covered the action items. Um, uh, Mr. Chair. Should, yes. I would move that we approve, uh, appoint uh, Brian Lynch uh, as our appointee to the Reeds Collaborative on the Board of Directors, our representative, and authorize you to sign the paperwork accordingly. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any, any comments or questions? Hearing none, Mr. Oakley? Aye. Mr. Rowe? Aye. Ms. Giovanoni? Aye. Ms. Janess? Aye. Mr. Stevens? Aye. And the chair votes aye. This is the usual thing we do every single year. 
Um, and so we thank the uh, superintendent for serving there. Um, I should mention there's a donation from Bay State Textiles to Middleborough High School. Uh, does anyone have anything at the end of the uh, meeting? Um, I checked quickly and Sean can, I believe, mention, I didn't see any other comments or questions. Uh, we thank those who sent us the comments or questions. Uh, we appreciate it. We thank the people who watched live. Um, and so with that, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to go into executive session for procedure three to discuss with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares, I so declare. Mr. Chair, I move yeah. that we enter into executive session only to re-enter public session for the purpose of adjournment. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Uh, this will, question. yes, please. Uh, do we have, we don't have a date for the next meeting yet? No. Um, Primarily because um, we can, you know, we can talk about that. We, we're allowed to talk about that separately. Okay. I've tried to run these meetings when there was information to pass on. Um, so I would assume I know there'll be a meeting um, probably end of May, early June, and then we can see where we're going. Uh, I think we'll have to make some determinations. Um, we know the 18th, the governor is going to announce or some plans or extend. Mm -hmm. Um, so we will have to have discussions, for example, about summer programs, um, what happens given whatever the governor's orders are. And I think more than just what the governor's orders are, we're going to have to understand what the social distancing requirements are. So for example, if we were only allowed to do an event, say with 25 or 30 people, then that limits our opportunities. And we're going to have to look at things in different ways. Does that answer your question, Greg? Yep. A anybody else have anything? Mr. Chair. Yes. Happy Mother's Day, Meg, and every all, all the other mothers out there. Yes, yes. And thank and I, I do want to thank all the administrators who are working extra hard, as are the teachers and as are our staff. They're all doing a fantastic job, and we want to thank the parents and the kids for hanging in there. We know it's difficult, uh, but we appreciate everything that you're doing. So with that, Mr. Oakley, to move into executive session? Aye. Mr. Rowe? Aye. Ms. Giovanoni? Aye. Ms. Janess? Aye. Mr. Stevens? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And we thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you.